So well, welcome everybody um, to tonight's showing of uh, Race to Paradise. Uh, my name's Steve Parkinson, if I haven't met you before, I'm the current uh, cruising captain here. And it's my <coughs> pleasure to do the introductions to our presenters. Um, uh, but be before I do that, um, we've got a couple of uh, people I'd like to acknowledge in the audience uh, who, who actually were on this race. Uh, one of them's Bernie Carks. Whereabouts is Bernie now? Yep, there Bernie's here. Uh, thanks for coming tonight, uh, Bernie. Um, and Bernie was not only on the race, but he won the Navigator's Prize on the race. So, uh, well done, Bernie. Um, and uh, the other person is Chris Kelly is also with us. Where's Chris now? Yeah, Chris. I want to uh, talk about you, Chris. And uh, your lovely wife, Fiona, who was also in, involved. Um, Chris was uh, a safety officer checking, and you'll see in the film shortly, checking safety equipment, uh, but he was also a competitor in the race. Uh, Fiona was uh, heavily involved with the race committee from Freshwater Bay, um, had to fly out to Cocos Islands and check everything out up there and uh, do a lot of organisation. Um, <clears throat> there's a little story there because um, Chris and Fiona weren't actually married at that stage and uh, oh. I believe the proposal actually happened up at Cocos Island, is that right Chris? <laughs> and uh, needless to say they have their daughter here with them tonight as well so that's all lovely, uh, lovely story so it came from uh, a real uh, island of uh, paradise I think. <laughs> um, and I'm sorry if I don't acknowledge any, that, uh, there's lots of uh, major people of course, but um, I'm sorry if I don't acknowledge everyone I should acknowledge, but uh, who, just could I ask for a show of hands, who was actually on this uh, race please? Oh, wow. oh, it looks like everyone's sitting on this side. <laughs> I think you people on that side will have to sail the cocos sometime soon, I think. Yeah, yeah thanks, so a fair, a fair uh, spread of people, so thanks for coming along here tonight. So I'll just say a little bit about the format that we're going to have. This film, uh, I'll <coughs> hand over to uh, Murray Smith and Bob Williams shortly to uh, get it rolling, but the film's about a 45-minute film, and then we'll have a short break uh, for a bar break, five or 10 minutes, and then uh, we'll be back for a Q&A from the valuable experiences of uh, <coughs> Murray and Bob uh, from uh, the Yacht Freight Train. Um, Bob, uh, maybe, do you mind standing up, Bob? Uh, um, thanks, Bob. Bob Williams, I hadn't met Bob uh, before. Um, but this is Bob Williams, for those who haven't met him. He's a very experienced yachty. Um, <coughs> it, uh, the previous owner of Freight Train. Um, <coughs> did this race, of course, but a lot more than that. Uh, five Sydney Hobarts in your freight train as well. Um, <coughs> did the uh, skipper of uh, Palmelia <coughs> in the uh, <coughs> um, Palmelia race, and also the fast net race, the really disastrous one uh, in 1979. So uh, had a harrowing experience there where uh, freight train was uh, one of, uh, there was only 80 finishes that year, I believe, out of uh, 300 yachts. So, you know, 50 finishes. Okay, right, uh, a shocker. Um, uh, Bob, uh, Bob also has uh, gone on to uh, creative stuff, I believe, um, in uh, <coughs> managing building projects and also with his own artworks and holding uh, uh, many art exhibitions as well. So um, Bob will help us with a, <coughs> a Q and A uh, with Murray um, after the film. Uh, Murray Smith, <coughs> uh, known to many of you here, of course, as Muzz. Um, Murray started sailing at the early age of four at uh, uh, Mounts Bay Sailing Club in Mudlarks. Um, he went on to do two Olympic campaigns in dinghies uh, and done lots of offshore racing, including this 
Coke is Island race on uh, freight train. Um, and uh, he's currently the <coughs> owner director, of course, of a uh, major channel rig rigging business in uh, O'Connor here in Boating Hardware that I'm sure you all know. Um, Murray's a long term member of Fremantle Sailing Club over 30 years which includes uh, six years service on the board here. So that's uh, fantastic, Murray, and we really appreciate that you've uh, volunteered to uh, give us a showing and tell us a bit and answer any questions about this uh, film about the race to paradise. So I'd just like to hand over to you, Murray Smith. Thank you. Thank you. trying to figure out which version of this we, uh, we need to play. Um, a, a question that I've... Can you hear me? Yes. A question that I've been asked uh, already tonight is, what's this about? Um, and what it's about is simply, uh, Bob and I managed to take freight train up to Cocos Island 34 years ago, and one of the, uh, uh, one of the crew members on one of the other boats was Simon Reeve from Channel 7, whom I knew did a bit of surfing with at the time, and Simon actually gave me a copy of what you're about to see tonight. I don't know if any of the people in the audience who were also on the race took copies off when uh, Channel 7 aired it, but uh, I don't know how many copies there are left. We're not allowed to uh, make money out of showing it or anything like that. The whole idea was, in these COVID times, barley becomes pretty difficult, as we all know, uh, the offshore committee and a few of those members have spoken to me and said, you know, what do you think about Cocos? Well, frankly, I don't know why we go to Bali, because Cocos is paradise and we haven't been back there for 34 years. And it's about time there's another yacht race there. That's all it's about. Create some interest. Uh, and if uh, people are interested enough, I'm sure they'll end up with some sort of rally, cruise, race or something that goes on up there. <clears throat> I recently moved house and I found the video. Um, so I spoke to Steve Parco about the video and said, hey, look, um, it's a VCR, it's not terrific, it's 34 years old, but if you can get into a format electronically that we can show, um, I'm happy for you to use it with your cruising division. That's how this night came to be. Um, I hadn't seen it until about two weeks ago uh, for at least 20 years. Um, firstly, I need to acknowledge that the Cocos Island race, there was only one, and it was run and organised by Royal Freshwater Bay Yacht Club, and uh, I think Fiona Kelly, who is here, was instrumental in getting this thing organised. <clears throat> they did a terrific job, and I need to also acknowledge Channel 7. The doc documentary is pretty self-explanatory that it's theirs. Um, lots of familiar faces in the audience, but also when you have a look at the uh, video, there is a heap of familiar faces. Some sadly are no longer with us, including some from Freight Train. Um, I've spoken to sailing friends uh, that still live on Cocos Island. Um, one of those guys is a one-year-old in the video. Um, and I still see him regularly. I spoke to him last night and he sent me a little video of their uh, Dukong racing, which is a little dinghy they race up there. Um, they've said openly they would welcome another yacht race anytime. So we know that that end of the course is ready and willing. Um, the Orla board, the Offshore Racing Board of WA, uh, via um, Mikey Giles today, sent a message saying they are also in full support. So um, from there, I'm going to let other powers that be take it. I don't care who organise it organises it, don't care if it's Frio, Freshy, South Perth, or Orla, or Cocos Island Yacht Club. Um, it'd just be lovely uh, to go back there again because it's sensational, as hopefully you'll see. Let's let the video run and hope you enjoy it. All good.
and all 1,600 nautical miles across the Indian Ocean. The finish line off Direction Island at the Cocos Killing Group. No cakewalk. You're out there with the elements and fighting the seas, and every day is a different day. I've never seen two days or alike in actually sailing or ocean racing. I love the ocean racing. If we get the right wings, which are the southeast trades, um, we'll be sliding downhill all the way with the kite up. And uh, good winds, we can get up to 20 knots at times. We'll be comfortable as far as downstairs is concerned, but uh, by no means as comfortable as boats like Passengers Reef, uh, for instance. Um, it's a dry shoot, we have no alcohol on board while we sail. Uh, at the other end of the, the track, it's a different story, the boys like a drink. <laughs> Well, the race is uh, limited to 359 hours, so I, <laughs> I, uh, I hope I make it in that time. We were to accompany the fleet on the old wishbone catch Camelot. For most of the crew, including myself, the ocean voyage was a first, a test of stamina and stomach. The Royal Freshwater Bay Yacht Club, nestled among the million dollar mansions in Peppermint Grove, was the host club for the race, past Commodore John Plunkett, or the cap of race organiser. We went back about uh, 130 years on uh, records at the Meteorological Bureau and uh, on that basis we established that we were in the middle between the end of one cyclone season and the beginning of the next. And the other uh, thing that we had to look at was the Hari Raya festival on uh, Cogus Island for the Cogus Malays and we wanted the boats to be finishing in the last week. The only regular contact the islanders have with the outside world is via the weekly Australian Airlines charter. Every Tuesday lunchtime, the Big Bird brings in the island supplies. Staging a yacht race to such a remote outpost meant extra considerations. For the yachties, the first consideration was where they were sailing to. Might sound a little obvious, but very few Australians seem to know where the islands actually are. People either know nothing at all they think it's another country, or they just haven't heard of it at all, or they have heard of some of the more recent political events, uh, bits and pieces, but uh, there's very little general knowledge about the islands. Sometimes we have to uh, tell them where it is, how far it is from Perth and everything. But it's something that we're very interested in, uh, the Caucasus island itself and the people, the lifestyle, that we are having and uh, so that has been a very good experience for us to tell them, you know, what's the place like since the, uh, well, long before the uh, integration of it in Australia. Back at Fremantle, time for contemplating the voyage ahead. Excitement mixed with a pinch of trepidation for the novices. Anticipation mixed with that competitive edge for the seasoned sailors. Two years of planning was on the line. attention to the weather forecast leading up to departure day, Friday, May 29. As far as I was concerned, the blue skies, slight seas and light offshore breeze was a godsend. I don't know what others had been praying for, but somebody had heard mine. Being seasick on day one definitely wasn't in the script. Each yacht was subjected to a thorough customs check before setting sail. Routine business for all ocean crossings, just to make sure the provisions didn't contain something that would help cover expenses and leave over some spending money. Number one on the list of priorities for 12 days at sea, what else? We came a lot of frozen food, although they're fairly big freezer. And, um, uh, well, we tend to keep, uh, cook a lot with pressure cookers, um, pot roast and this sort of thing. Um, usually, uh, if the weather's good, there's not a great deal to do, other than cook and eat, uh, that's, a, that's a preoccupation.
place for most of the crew. Right, do you have your view distress sheet? Your emergency navigation lights. Can you just show that your emergency navigation lights work there? Okay, thanks very much. For the Cocos race, the yachts required a Category 1 safety certificate, the highest in international racing. Basically, it means each boat must be self-sufficient in food, water, fuel, and all manner of equipment. 11, 12, 13, you can two speed. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Everything's going to be checked, and we're going to replace everything that looks like the game. Lots and lots of spares. Spare cabins, spare shrouds, spare sails. Um, it's, you're on your own out there, so if anything that happens, you're going to be able to fix yourself. Veteran WA sailors Max Sheen and Eric Salomons are the do-it-yourself experts. While other people might talk about it, they accomplish it, like winning the Parmelia race eight years ago by themselves in their trusty SS-34 Bluebell. 100 days at sea in some almighty weather conditions. As for Cocos... We know what to expect, and we know what the boat can do, we know what she can take, and it's, they're unbeatable. It's a sea boat, they stand alone. Bluebell was one of six boats competing in the cruising division, along with the as good as new Lasseter's Reef, the 36 foot steel carter Tradition, the largest of the competitors, Jenny Philp, Quinko, a 40 foot fiberglass sloop, and the only overseas entrant, Potlatch from the United States. In the IOR, or Racing Division, the Mini Maxi Freight Train, owned by Perth businessman Bob Williams, was favourite for line honours. Ivan Ho from the stable of Perth designer Phil Curran was the winner of last year's Fremantle to Bali race. But the two star performers would suffer if the winds remained light against the highly rated Golden Eagle, skippered by husband and wife Ron and Ray Carterton, and the flashy Bedouin, another Phil Curran design, built for the Bali race. With the yachts packed and pampered for the voyage, time for final farewells. It would be a month at least before most of the crews returned to Fremantle, sailing. here and there, we're hoping not, um, but mostly uh, the daytime sailing will be trade winds and at night time uh, you could toss in some light weather I'm sure, we'll be drifting around now and again which uh, isn't good for the bigger boats in the fleet, the little boats seem to catch up. For Murray Smith and the crew of Freight Train those words would ring true nearing the finish. Technology plays a big role in ocean racing in this day and age, but one thing has never changed, you need the wind if you want to go anywhere. Max Sheen perhaps summed up the more fundamental aspirations of all the competitors. But uh, I believe, I'm quite confident, we'll get to Cocos and we'll get home again. And that's the main thing.
course if you want to be involved in international yacht racing. But fundamentally the challenge of, uh, of making a passage from point A to B under racing conditions, being involved with great competitors and fellow sportsmen, but, uh, generally yacht racing is a very challenging sport. Back in the ruck on board Camelot, there was a challenge we didn't need at the start of an ocean crossing. The snap was the breaking of a brand new wishbone from which the yacht derives its name. Unfortunately, it meant the unique wishbone sail would stay in its bag for the entire race. Running repairs were conducted on the break by helping hands from one of the spectator fleet. Ironically, our skipper is a believer in the old sea tradition that it's bad luck to set sail on a Friday. It is an old superstition going back to ancient times, I believe. Perhaps the Americans, uh, as was uh, your skipper, are a little more serious about these things than we are. As far as I'm concerned, it didn't make any difference to the race and I haven't heard one other complaint. Although Camelot wasn't a competitor and could use her motor at any time, it was obvious we would see little of the other yachts during the race. With that in mind, we provided Sony Handicams to three boats. Freight train. Oh yes, he's studying business and property. <laughs> Obviously part of Bob Williams and of course. Ivan Ho. Always get the hard job. And Golden Eagle. I'll tell you something, Mr. Long. You're a scruffy looking <laughs> Reef carried a Super 8 film camera for that real home movies look. Boeing cameramen on each of those yachts were given a crash course before we sailed. The results, as you'll see through the documentary, were sometimes brilliant. Usually humorous. achieve the objective. Technology has advanced. Pointing watch towards sun, a rotating globe. To see. Mark, right, I charted it, and we are south of Esperance. <laughs> yeah, something, something. 
with this child. Well, last year's Maui. With the breeze dropping off on the second day, Camelot, under power, gradually began to overhaul the fleet. Our first sighting was Quinko, owned by Perth dentist Bill Jacobs. The first rule of interviews at sea, I discovered, was to have a loud voice. Good sailing so far! How was the night? How was the night? Okay? Even after a mere 24 hours, it was quite an event to see other human beings. Was this the first sign of madness? <laughs> Some things you can prepare for, others you can't. On dry land, I recall, eating was something you did without a second thought. At sea, eating is more of an art form, a matter of coordinating the hand and the eye with the rolling of the boat. On Camelot, the gimbal table was our lifeline to the food, the thin line between survival and starvation. Then, of course, there was the stomach to consider. Incredibly, no one on board suffered from the dreaded lurgy for the whole trip. A few of us thought about it every now and then, but never reached, if you'll pardon the expression, the point of no return. Well, I mean, you just sort of, if you're going to be sick, don't be frightened to be sick and get it over and, and uh, get plenty of, uh, um, sort of light foods into you and get a good sleep. I'm usually sick on nation rest the first couple of days. It doesn't weigh me flat, I feel pretty awful. I'm going to lose some weight and I'll probably end up there with about It's like a terminal illness. Ivanhoe was one of its first victims. 15 miles off uh, Geraldton, mm -hmm. we fell into a hole. We were there for three hours and we just stood still. The breeze kicked in and we went uh, straight on and then we turned left north at the North Island of uh, the North Island of the Piedmont of Dallas. And next day we fell into another hole and sat there and we actually did 10 miles all day. The smaller fry, like Golden Eagle, can squeeze the most from the light puffs of wind. In these conditions, they make the big bloke sweat. We were lucky, uh, I guess we got the right air, so it's certainly a set of Golden Eagle, especially if you trim it all the time. We did trim the whole time, changed change spinnakers, um, or sometimes, even within court, three quarters of an hour, you have about five different spinnaker changes from like uh, 1.5 hours down to three quarter up to 1.2 and back again. Because the winds were very, very variable out there. They were moving all around and one day it went from east all the way up to north, northwest, down to south and back to east again. So it was, it was quite amazing. still, moonless night, we chugged alongside Lassiter's Reef for some friendly banter. Owner Jim Carroll has raced yachts for many years. These days, the pace is a little more leisurely. I don't need 16, I can hear you! <laughs> Sometimes in a boat it can be uncomfortable and wet and uh, hungry. On this occasion, uh, the weather was in the right, uh, wind was in the right direction, we had very good facilities in this boat. Uh, food is excellent. We had a fine cellar, uh, good company, good stories. We watched a few minute videos. Overall, uh, it's probably as enjoyable as time as we have. A yacht racing crew was broken up into watch teams. We had three teams of three going around the clock, which meant eight hours at the wheel every day. The night watch became a sort of personal think tank conversation virtually non-existent. There were the stars, the sea, the boat, and the compass. Nothing else seemed to matter. One of those rare occasions when the worries of the world were a million miles away. on the Indian Ocean, Paradise prepared itself for the mini-invasion. For the yacht 
Rocky's accommodation, a large army tent was erected on Direction Island. Those wishing for some terra firma after the sea voyage could rub shoulders with the hermit crabs. That was the original tent. Second one goes first. Two and a half hours. Oh, two and a half hours. First one was five hours. In an age of rampant commercialism, Cocos Keeling is a rare jewel. Unspoiled by Western standards, the islands and their people waited with interest for the yachties. Life is pretty simple in this part of the world. When the work's done, you take a dip and a sip in the pool. If that's too hard, you can always catch up on some reading under a boring old coconut tree. There are some big decisions to make. Of course, some of the locals were a little put out by all the fuss, but you can't please everyone. Direction Island is a favourite port of call for hundreds of yachtsmen and women making their way around the world. Understandable. Across the lagoon, the Cocos Malays staged a race of their own as part of a week of festivities on Home Island. Their boats are called Jukongs and are used mainly for fishing. During the war, Direction Island, or DI as the locals call it, was used as a base for Catalinas. The very same moorings were dusted off again for the race fleet. Hardly the threat as that post 45 years ago. The waters around Cocos are a diver's dream and a navigator's nightmare. Boatmaster Harry Bingham, a former Navy diver himself, would have the job of ensuring the yachts made it safely to Anchorage. I believe there wouldn't be any problem because of the, you know, uh, all the high rise I see that, uh, you know, beer and been served, you know, so, okay. as, as long as the, you know, there is no. No, no, no. Meetings were staged with the Cocos Council, which is responsible for life on Home Island, and the West Island Administration, headed up by Carolyn Stewart. Apart from servicemen on R&R, &R, this was the first time a large group of outsiders had planned to venture into the Atoll community. From the southeast, the fleet edged closer to the islands. The wind continued to chop and change direction, sometimes steady, most times not. The conscientious reporter sweated it out on the decks, longing to be back in the office in the cold weather. The overworked producer managed to squeeze in some much needed rest, while on the bow, our studious navigator sought some inspiration for another harrowing afternoon fix. What with all those crashing waves and cyclonic winds, it really took it out of a person. Morale was low. We were forced to play charades as daily punishment. Probably the worst one on the way up. 
uh, me, I think, blocking the beer up, yeah. which I did in uh, the Bali race. I think I got two dummy awards. <laughs> Back on Camelot, our skipper was trying to convince us of the green flash, a phenomenon that occurs for a split second when the sun kisses the horizon, so he said. Personally, I think it has to do your eye on it. Yeah. Where's Kit? I'm uh, getting close, you guys. Now watch it, I can see some green already. Uh, yeah, yeah, look at that. Look at that little bit of green right there. Little flash of green, little flash of red. Yeah. Watch it, Kit comes. Stand by. Stand by. memories. For us, the sighting of a humpback whale. For the Ivanhoe and Lasseter's reef crews, schools of porpoises racing their boats through the swells. But all the sights and sunsets are worth nothing if you don't observe the law of the sea that is time eternal. Love, or at least tolerate thy neighbour. <laughs> After you've been asleep for a few days, you feel as if you're all in a box. Well, everyone needs to be uh, sensible and compatible, and uh, obviously you can't believe it, but they just need to be uh, sportsmen. They want to get on and do a job and, and want to win, and uh, that's what they're there for. They're all there to help each other. You want basically teams and shipping. Uh, it's like anything, any other business, sport, teamwork's what it's all about. You need people that are prepared to fit into a team situation. What better to promote team harmony than a birthday? Incredibly, Golden Eagle had three of them during the race, including that of skipper Ray Carterton. Happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday, Clearly ahead of uh, the other boats on handicap. 
I think we sailed a good race. The boat was sailed to its optimum, and uh, we got as much speed out of the boat as we possibly could, and got here, I think, under pretty good time. I think we raced the boat very well. Ten hours after freight train's arrival, the coconut palms appeared on the horizon from the deck of Camelot. You felt something like a cast member of Gilligan's Island. Land never looked so good. The last two hours were the longest of the trip. As we neared Direction Island, a lone dolphin joined in the welcoming party. Nice touch from the locals. through the lagoon's intricate reef system, past the been there, done that line on us chap, and at last to our mooring. Stretched out before us, some of the most breathtaking island scenery anywhere in the world. Absolutely beautiful. Most of the races we're used to, you finish somewhere that's pretty cold and pretty windy, and you've got a long sail back, which often is no fun, but to finish in a place like this, which is uh, beautiful water, beautiful winds, uh, palm trees, the white beach, uh, coral fish, uh, good company. You wouldn't find a better place to finish your operas. If you drop your sail and home to in the direction of the red flashing lights, we'll lead you in for your anchorage. Hello, girls. Hello, girls. Hello, you guys. Hello, Hello. 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 I'm all right, but I don't know about the Fordix stuff. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, 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 over the next four days, the rest of the fleet made its way safely to the finish line. Lassiter's Reef, Ivanhoe, Bedouin, and at sunrise on the 11th day, Golden Eagle. to the lifestyle. Idyllic is the word that springs to mind. Well, I think it's quite a good lifestyle. Uh, we start work early here, finish around about 3.30 for the average worker. And um, except for people on shift work, uh, there's a good part of the day left for fishing or swimming or going out in boats. And some people are diving these days and surfing. Harry Bingham has lived on Cocos for five years. He's a sizable part of the furniture. Island life agrees with him and he with it. You watch the children grow up here, uh, you know, even the children from down south, the uh, um, children from down Perth that come up here and their family work here. Uh, they blossom in a climate like this, it never gets cold, it never gets hot. They go to school in a pair of shorts and a single every day, and there's no Wellington boots and no raincoats, so it's a very good environment for children to grow up in. Andrew Grant, that's him on the board, is the surfing conservator of Cocos Keeling. That's not the political kind, but the flora and fauna kind. to do. It's a job that means a lot to me, but it's not a beer and skittles. Often working outside in the sun is a lot tougher than being in the air-conditioned office. You have a lot of biting insects, uh, it can be tiring, and uh, you, you may be looking at the water all day, but you can't go and swim in it because you've got a job to do. But there are other times when you think you're the luckiest person in the world. No family has been more closely aligned with the history of Cocos Keeling than the Clooney's Ross clan. The attractions are many. A slightly slower pace, and I know where everything is. I can get things done. Uh, uh, 
in, in the smoke, I tend to get a bit lost. You know, everything's a bit too fractured. You know, some guy specializes in something which is unique, but you don't know who specializes in it. Here, one guy cover a fair bit, and you know who to see about something. It's, you know, it's, and it's slow pace. It, well, I suppose it's not, but it appears slow. <laughs> Easier on the answers. For John Clooney's Ross and many who come to Cocos, it's a case of nice place to visit, wouldn't want to leave there. The Home Islanders are a very gentle, hospitable people. Their customs and culture have great significance and importance in day-to-day -day life. It was quite something for them to have the chance to show others a glimpse of that culture and mix with an entirely different group of people. School teacher Pauline Bunce has a close association and a great understanding of the people of Home Island. We only have a, an aircraft here once a week that might bring, perhaps at the most, a dozen new faces onto the island. And here all at once we've got 60 or 70 new faces determined to have a good time and uh, it's had quite an effect on West Island and uh, Home Island got a bit of a, a surprise last night, I think, with some of the characters. As well as sharing some of their unique dancing with the sailing set, a sizable feast was also laid out for the visitors. Rest assured, no one went without. All the yachties were received uh, magnificently from the local people. We were the biggest group that's ever gone into Cocos and uh, the friendliness given to us by the local population was incredible. If we wanted help with anything, it just happened. You didn't even ask for it. Even the school children were involved in the Cocos race, with a competition run by their teachers for the best drawings in different grades. Yachts and yachties found their way into just about every facet of island life. Ten on the yep, and the eleven at clip eight two. Forget the Melbourne Cup, the highlight of the racing season here is the Cocos Cup, featuring, what else, hermit crabs. The annual meeting was arranged to coincide with the yacht race. Dollars were furiously exchanged, form guides were scrutinised, and the crabs did the rest. And Grant, what do you look for in a hermit crab? Oh, a bit of size, a bit of colour, you know, a bit of age. There's various things you can look for. What about ring-ins? Is there ever any problem with ring-ins? We don't have to find cottons here, mate. Don't worry about us. there's anything strange in racing hermit crabs. It's a serious business. First to the outside ring takes the money and the glory. This was a 10 event card with some of the slickest little critters ever to crawl out from a shell. For the conservationists, yes, they go back to the beaches after the meeting. Good sailing and good times for all. In the wash-up, Golden Eagle took handicap honours, aided by the light winds and some excellent crew work. Bedouin was placed second and freight train third. Bluebell chalked up yet another victory in the cruising division. As yacht races and first experiences go, the Fremantle to Cocos was an all-round winner. The Royal Freshwater Bay Yacht Club are hoping to make this a biannual event. Mm. Naturally, there will always be teething problems with an inaugural race, but with good foundations laid, it's expected the fleet will be considerably larger in 1989. 1,600 nautical miles is a long way to sail, but when paradise is the port of call...
All right, we're just going to have a short, uh, about 10 minute break, and then um, we'll have a Q&A with Murray and uh, Bob to hear more about it. So see you then. Save your questions up. Or a mixture or whatever it was. Just as people come to uh, take a seat, can we have anyone who was in the race come up the front please so anyone who participated in the race and of course the likes of fiona come on up the front we have any focus island race participants Come on, those who put their hand up to say they did the race. Come on up. Bernie, we're waiting on you to come to the front. <laughs> I think everyone that's on this side should have changed. The tall guy. Yeah, yeah, the tall guy. Bernie, come up to the front, please. Bernie. <laughs> I am sure there was a few more hands that went up, but uh, look, before we get into the q and I just wanted to say congratulations to this lot. 34 years ago, these guys did uh, a big long yacht race, so congratulations. <laughs> Okay. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll say a few words and I'm glad these people are sitting down because I sure wouldn't want to. It's a bit daunting seeing yourself after 34 years and hearing yourself. And, um, especially these days when a good friend of mine tells me I have a TMB disease. I have the TMB disease. Too many birthdays. <laughs> I'm sure it's a few in the room that would share that with me too. Um, on my office wall, I have a half model of freight train that was made for me by a great friend, John Fitzharding, the late John Fitzharding, who I'm sure many in this room will remember. And occasionally I look at the boat, uh, the half model, beautifully built, with the plaques that are on plywood backing, and there's Hobart race badges, clip a cup from Hawaii, a race from Esperance to Fremantle, only ever held once, we still hold the line on us for that, <laughs> and the, uh, and of course the race to Cocos, and I look at that, the line on us, Plark, 15, 70 miles, freight train, fastest, and I've, for years I've thought, why isn't this race repeated? It was such a pleasure of all the yacht racing I've done, and I'm, I'm sure Murray agrees, it was the most pleasurable race. Weather condition wise, the destination, uh, everything about it, just tick the boxes. And we've held the line on us for 34 years. We'd love to give it up. If, if the race is run again, I'd like to donate a Lion Honours Trophy, the freight train Lion Honours Trophy, 
so anybody here is involved in that. Thank you. Um, and be involved in some way. I have a business these days. I'll take this opportunity of giving it a plug. Mr. Bob Puzzles, we're the largest wooden jigsaw puzzle maker in Australia. Oh, brilliant. And uh, we'd like to be involved. That company would like to be involved in the race in some way if it goes ahead. So I can only endorse what a great event it was, what a great adventure, uh, the camaraderie that took place, and thoroughly endorse the race being held sometime again in the future. I hope it does. Thank you. All good. sure how this is going to work, whether we hand this microphone around or people just stand up and we can hear them. Um, we'll attempt the, the latter. So, uh, happy to answer questions if our memory can help it. <laughs> <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit about the journey back? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think it was a hard I can tell you about the journey back. There is. Um, I was just talking with Helen Risley a minute ago and she was reminding us of Bedouin's journey back. They uh, ventured out for one day, broke a horse day and ended up back repairing it at Cocos uh, and I had forgotten that. Um, freight train's journey back, we raced up there uh, with a full crew and came back with a, a delivery crew of five. Um, we actually got back faster than we went up there. Uh, we had breeze all the way, we didn't run out of wind but it was on the nose the entire trip at about 15 to 18 knots. Um, so we figured we could go south uh, and get ourselves into some westerlies and that just didn't happen. Um, so we beat our way home, but uh, the 62 foot, as they called them back then, the Mini Maxi, was pretty comfortable even uh, on the nose in 15 or 18 knots. So we were back uh, in a faster time than we went up there. Just wonder, did, did someone keep going, like cruising, you know, Indian Ocean Circuit or something? The yachts then? Can I, can I answer that? Uh, not, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Ambassadors Reef uh, sailed through to the Mediterranean. Oh, wow. <laughs> and it took a long time to get back. <laughs> and they came back the day of Linda Best wing, which was here at the Yacht Club and made so much noise they couldn't hear the reception. <laughs> well, that's probably a good idea. <laughs> so there we go. Yes, um, Jim one boat at least continued. I know Jim Carroll's Lassiter's Reef went off to the Med and stayed there for a great number of years, I think, and then came back. Um, but, uh, most boats just returned to Fremantle. Why wasn't the race ever repeated? Good question. I honestly don't know. So if the race was going to go ahead again... Yeah. Sorry? With it scheduled to be two years later, 
who've been suggesting that. I was reminded of eight years. But if there's some interest, I think uh, that's what tonight is uh, can be about. Yeah, I think there's a sort of keep it simple principle that has to be kept in mind. You make the race as it was in the first place, pretty simple, straightforward. But that, that's only your personal opinion. Chris, I would be interested. My understanding is that there's no anchorage at Christmas Island. Um, so I... Here's your man. Yeah, yep. correct that. <laughs> yeah. Please do. Um, yeah, re a resident of uh, Christmas Island for uh, 15 years. Oh. Um, yeah, regarding uh, the Anchorage Christmas Island, um, it's basically it's not an all weather, not an all all year um, anchorage. It's basically. I'll well, give you that. People put that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So um, Christmas doesn't offer a safe anchorage uh, during the, uh, the the rainy season, the wet season. So between sort of uh, November to April. Um, possibility of north and monsoon. Basically, you get swells that come into Flying Fish Cove, uh, which makes it very un unsuitable for, bo for boats that come in. But uh, during the normal period of the uh, trade winds, from about April to November, uh, it's on the sheltered side of the island. Um, basically, it's 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 a, it's a very calm anchorage. We we provide uh, moorings for visiting yachts. Um, we can. We can add moorings if we need them. Um, the, the, the great advantage of Christmas over Cocos is the, um, the access to facilities. So um, when you go ashore at Flying Fish Cove, you've got your um, toilets and showers, you've got your barbecues, and then you're walking distance to uh, the bank, the post office, the visitor centre, supermarkets, fuel supply, blah, blah, blah. Um, also, it provides a different experience to Cocos Christmas Island is a much larger island, 135 square kilometres. Um, two thirds of the island is, is national park. Um, this is um, mostly a pristine uh, rainforest, so you've got an abundance of crabs. You've got uh, uh, all the unique bird life. Also, <coughs> you've got um, fabulous uh, scuba diving, etc., etc. Uh, and, and the best um, shore dive for uh, for snorkeling. Uh, funnily enough, is right at Flying Fish Cove, where the where the yachts come in. So uh, we, we think it's a, it's an ideal um, destination for for an event like this. And um, just uh, about eight years ago, I did approach Chris and Bernie Cargs and others at uh, Fremantle Sailing Club with the idea of of having a, an event that would go to uh, Christmas, Cocos, and then return to Fremantle. Um, so Christmas Island is about. Um, uh, 1,400 miles from Fremantle, the same distance as Bali. <coughs> and then you've got uh, a leg from Christmas to Cocos, which is about 600 miles. And then you've got your um, return leg to Fremantle. But you could either do it that way, or just simply do Christmas. Um, but uh, we think we have uh, a great deal to offer. Um, pardon? Still the World Art. Oh yes, now the World, world Art comes into, Art uh, Rally comes into Christmas, and then of course they carry on to Cocos. But um, yeah, so we always suggest to our friends um, when they come, um, not, not to do Christmas alone, uh, but, but also to combine in a visit to the Cocos Island. I think, we think the, um, the combination of Christmas and Cocos is basically an unbeatable uh, destination. Good. Thank you. Uh, just a quick note, my name's Todd Gerardo. Uh, here I sit on the Orwell board. We have actually pencilled in the Cocos race for April or May 2025. Ooh, there you go. Uh, so April, May, um, only one thing that I hear from the locals is uh, April is Ramadan and uh, that may impact the timing. Yeah. It'll be different by then. Yeah. If there, yeah. I, just, just to carry on from the very first question on how you got home, uh, what about all the other boats? Did most everyone go directly from Cocos to Fremantle without any stops or were there 
Were there, uh, was there a great variation in, in the uh, routing for the boats that returned to Fremantle? To my knowledge, they, I don't know anybody that went north and came down the coast. To my knowledge, uh, most of the boats, if not all of them, came straight back to Fremantle. So it was non-stop, basically, yeah. for, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes. Ivanhoe would have gone to Gerald's. If I could just add a little uh, discussion of a little anecdote, I suppose, that we, we launched freight train in 1983, and I engaged a fellow from Hobart by the name of Graham Freeman, Frizzle Freeman. Might be a few in the room that, that remember Frizzle, now passed away. Frizzle came on board our boat. We had 18 crew members from Perth who went over and did the Hobart race in 1983. I was looking at a film the other night called uh, The Full Metal Jacket. I don't know how many have seen The Full Metal Jacket. I remember the staff sergeant? Well, Frizzle was exactly the same as that guy. He took us under his wing and he punished us. He, he made us feel like we were absolutely worthless, useless pieces, whatever you want to call it. And he knocked us into a crew, and we did very well that year in the Hobart. Uh, the next, he went on and got involved in the America's Cup, so we didn't have Frizzle. I, I have an association with the Smith family going back many years. Murray's father, Roger, was a crew member of six members on board Parmelia when we did the Parmelia race. And Roger was a stalwart member of that crew. Absolutely a rock solid fellow that you could rely on. The DNA in the Smith family has got yachting in it. We all know that. So there I was without a sailing master. And Murray put his hand up. At that stage, I think he was 24. And he came on board and took over from where Frizzle left off. And what Frizzle had done is instilled in the boat, if we're going to race, we're going to race seriously, we're going to do everything we can to win. And, and Murray took over and nothing changed. It was as I say, at 26 years of age, we, when we did the uh, Cocos, you were what, 24? Uh, 20, you were 26 when we did the Cocos, you were 24 when you came on Sailing Master. I look at him now, he's nearly 60, I'm nearly 80. And, uh, and just what a remarkable sailor he is and what his family are. But I wanted to share that story with you. It's very special for me to be able to sit next to a man that I've known for that long and we had such a close relationship in, in sailing our yacht. As hard as we could do it, we won the South Pacific Maxi Championship in 1985. We came fifth. Lionel was fifth in the Hobart race and won A division in the Hobart race in 1985. Yeah, this man was uh, much, very much a part of that. I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. Oh, good. Thanks, Paul. Back to Cocos. <laughs> Something to do with K-pop pillows, and I used to like pillows, them. and he used to put his head on the pillow a fair bit more than everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> Contrary to Bob's just comments, just made. Um, Murray, can we just take an opportunity? There are a number of cruising people in the room to just draw in this race to Cocos back in '87, where we were on the boat for 10, 10 or so days, and. Uh, I just think it's important to share the importance of being on a cruising boat, of which I was on one, and if I could just recount very quickly what do you want there? Just so people can hear, Chris. Thanks. Yeah, I don't normally need this. So we get off the start line and the number was what is it to Cocos? Guys? 319. That's the course to Cocos Island. 
And so we had all this duty-free, what do you call the stuff you drink? <laughs> Rum. Okay. So we had two cartons of one litre bottles of Gordon's gin, 12 o'clock each day. The top was thrown over the side. The seven crew lined up with their high tumblers. The bottle was got rid of seven times. The ice, we made ice on board, by the way. Did you have ice on your boat, Mum? <laughs> and we then put the lemons in and we then had that. That was the free lunch drink. Each crew member had to take six bottles of red on board with them for the duration, there were seven of us. And when we got past Rottnest, the sailing master, Wyvern Seabrook, said, oh, sugar, I've left the 18 loaves of bread in the back of my car. So we made bread every day. The point I'm trying to make is that these destinations are really important for the cruising fraternity, and I know they're here. So we, there is an interest in creating another race to Cocos, and it has been, as was explained, that it has been thought of, and there are some inspirational people. I know there's a rear commodore here from Hillary's Yacht Club who has some interest. So it, it, it's very doable, very possible that we could get something going as a result of what Steve and Murray and Bob have created here tonight. The important message I wanted to share was going on these, these destination situations, whether we go to Cocos, whether we go to Christmas, it's just there is an appetite and there has been shown in the COVID times that there is an opportunity to create this. Is there an interest in the room that we should support what Todd Gerardo said and see whether we could get something going in two years' time? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's what we're Steve. That's what you're aiming for tonight. Oh. <clears throat> uh, it's all about uh, getting the discussion rolling. It seems like it's rolling very nicely. Yeah. I mean, personally, I'll be keen. It looks quite idyllic to me. And so. Uh, I've been flat out trying to get ready to go to Exmouth at the moment, but I think uh, when once the boat's ready, it'll be it'll be ready to go to Cocos in a couple of years' time. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I think that through the, your marketing for tonight, we've got a uh, a way of talking to uh, everyone that's here, and uh, certainly through um, Bernie's interests, I think that it's worth having a go at. So, um, thank you very much. Chris, I finally worked out what your criteria is for cruising yacht races. The boat's got to have a bread maker. <laughs> well, you've got to have an ice maker. Well, what about that on Siddiqui Rum? Mate, eh? we had it all. Uh, just on the logistics side, uh, talking about coming back. Um, an anecdotal story was Bob walked out the dock. Uh, not far behind him to hop on board to go on the race. I was already on board and I, I do remember Bob coming downstairs and I think chasing him down the stairs was the uh, customs guy. And Bob looked up the front and saw my surfboard hanging up. And as the owner sort of went, what's that all about? After a little discussion, the surfboard stayed. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, I'd done my homework because I knew that there was some really good surf at, uh, at Cocos and I wanted to go and get involved in it. Um, when we got up there, uh, the, the flights back then are a bit different to now. The flights back then were once a week. Now it's twice a week and uh, I believe, and there's people in the room obviously know more than I do about what goes on up there right now, but um, the, uh, I think they went Cocos, Cocos Christmas one week and then um, Christmas Cocos the next or something. Um, and I stayed for two flights, so I was there for a fortnight because the surf was good, not because the wind was good to get home. Um, and we flew some people in, so uh, most of our crew actually flew out, and the people that were uh, assisting me on the delivery home uh, flew in from Perth just to do the delivery. Um, so, and there were a number of boats did that sort of exchange, and I do remember that uh, at the time. But, uh, I think the flights now are a little more frequent, um, and that may be a little easier to do. 
Yeah, there's, um, if you go on to the Copeless Gearling, um, sort of, they've got a, a website there from their tourism board. Um, you'll see a bunch of stuff about diving and swimming and uh, kite surfing is massive there at the moment. And we do remember, uh, there was, Bob and I talked about it earlier, there's a, a channel between um, the ocean and the inner lagoon of, of the atoll um, over on one island. And that channel is basically an open air aquarium that you put a pair of goggles on, jump in at one end, the tide takes you all the way through it. Um, and it's absolutely stunning. And I see a couple of heads nodding in the audience and those who have done it, it is outstanding to see. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the, the little video, 20 second or so video I had of the Dukong racing that was sent to me from Azzy last night from Cocos, um, if I can show people on my phone as I walk through later, the colour just doesn't do it justice. Um, I assume Christmas has got similar sort of uh, conditions, it's all up in that tropical sort of area. But yeah, the, unfortunately, a 34-year-old uh, um, old VHS video uh, doesn't bring out the colour that it otherwise might. <coughs> Is there any more questions? Would right. you do it again? Would I do it again? That's a serious question from you. Um, I retired from ocean racing after my last race with Moira. So, um, <laughs> um, because of the crew. Would I do it again? Uh, Cocos would probably see me go for another sale. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Bob, uh, can we put you in then, Murray? We'll put you on our boat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Will it be possible to get a copy? Look, the answer is yes. The caveat I put on it is that um, I don't know how to copy it other than just to stick it onto a thumb drive of some sort. Uh, if you've got a little hard disk or something, I'm happy to give you that. My copy has the ad breaks where you saw the, um, the header, header come back up each time. So you sit there for 30 seconds watching a 543210 happen. Um, the Fremantle Sailing Club and Steve as the copy you saw tonight. Uh, that would be the better copy. I understand Chris is going to show it, hopefully at uh, Hillary's at some stage, Chris? Correct. But there was Excuse another me? copy, I, I do remember they had some other footage in it that uh, was on the TV, Channel 7, perhaps. It also used to have the, the backing track of um, John I mean, it's yeah. pretty much the same, but there were a few variants. I'm happy to share the one I've got. I would suggest Fremantle would happily um, share within reason uh, on numbers the uh, copy that they've got. Um, again, provided it's not shown for monetary value, uh, i.e. people paying tickets because it's a seven proprietary product, that's all. Yeah. So, Murray, I just want to reinforce, I mean, my memories of the race were um, really good, positive. It was a great um, great sailing condition. I just like the idea that it's Australian, whether it's uh, Christmas included or not. Um, it's, uh, it's Australian territory and I think most of us are aware we're going to be a year or two before international travel opens up and uh, um, it gives us an option that's uh, pretty idyllic. Yeah. Uh, Christmas, uh, Christmas Island, 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 Christmas Look, it's perfectly calm, as I said, from about April to November, because uh, it's on the it's on the north. Um, let's see, it's on the northern side of the island, so the prevailing winds are the trade winds, southeast, and and the the island is um, has got high great altitude, so it's a thousand feet above sea level, right? So you've got uh, these um, inland cliffs uh, surrounding uh, Flying Fish Cove, so. 
the winds actually pass over the island, leaving the, uh, the cove perfectly calm for certainly April to November. It's perfect, perfect conditions. And no roll. Um, so you can you can get you can get a little bit of uh, a little bit of a um, surge, a slight surge. Um, now there was an issue uh, which I raised uh, long long ago. Uh, they used to have the hard moorings like they have at Rottnest, which would drive you nuts. You know, oh, you're banging against the hull. Yeah, you're banging against the hull. But they have in um, the last couple of years, they've all been replaced with soft. Okay. Soft floats, okay. so it's not an issue. You would not find it an issue at all. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay, Steve. Hi. Yes. <laughs> Thanks very much, guys. If I could just add a little bit on the uh, video thing. Um, thanks very much, Murray, for uh, providing your video tape and making it available and sharing it. And we do, yes, now have it on our hard drive form. And <coughs> it's very good of you to share <coughs> all of that with us. Um, the club <coughs> does put these topics on uh, a YouTube uh, channel. So that is the plan that uh, <coughs> This will be put on a, a YouTube, and we've had people contacting us from overseas who are interested, and uh, we've told them uh, that, that that will be posted up there as soon as we can do that. But it's very good of you to make uh, the footage available. And thank you very much for sharing the experience with us all here tonight. I think it's been fantastic. Uh, I'm sure everyone agrees, and I think you've... Um, um, whetted our appetite and uh, you've really got the, the ball going and with the authorities there with Orwa and um, uh, the enthusiasm seems to be that you've uh, very much helped the, get the ball rolling again so I'm sure something will come out of it down the track but thanks for sharing uh, Murray and, uh, and Bob, good on you guys and have a little have a appreciation. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, as I say, the whole intent of tonight was just to share some info and watch a movie. Um, the, uh, if it goes ahead, I might just book a, a stateroom on platinum, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everyone. <laughs>